In this presentation, we will take a look at some events that occurred in Matthew chapter 8, Mark chapter 4, and Luke chapter 7. As with all the videos, I encourage you to read these chapters before listening to the video so you'll have the details and story down. As sometimes I will just give explanation to certain verses and not necessarily read them and go through all the details. And I think it would be more helpful to you if you do that. So let's begin with Matthew chapter 8, which now starts the miracles of Jesus. If you remember, we just finished the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5 through 7. After the great Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus teaches how a disciple of Christ come unto him and become, and become perfected in Christ, Matthew then proceeds to give an account, give accounts of miracles Jesus performs. It is as if Matthew is saying to us that just as Jesus can heal you of your physical infirmities, he can also heal us of our spiritual infirmities and able, enable us to become like him through repentance and the principles just outlined in the Sermon on the Mount. I don't think it's a coincidence that Matthew all of a sudden gives a bunch of miracles right after the Sermon on the Mount. I think he's trying to show, look, I have the power to heal you. If I can do it physically, then I can also do it spiritually. If you just abide by the principles that I have taught. Each of these miracles... Uh, Ellen McConkey writes this, each of these miracles was performed not alone for the benefit and blessing of the suffering Israelite whose body was afflicted, but as a witness to the growing group of opponents that he whom they opposed came from God and had divine power. The wicked and rebellious in Israel, word upon word and miracle after miracle, were being left without excuse. Their sins were being bound securely upon their own heads. The light they were rejecting was shining forth everywhere in word and in deed. So as he performs each miracle, he is testifying of his power, of his divine sonship, of his godhood, and showing to his opponents, op op opponents that are opposing him that he is the Son of God. And they're going to have to come to grips with that. See, in the end, they either have to kill him and get rid of him, or they have to believe him. And unfortunately, we know from the Gospels which one they choose. So let's turn to the miracle of Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 through 13. Again, I won't go through the details of this, but just comment on it. This is the centurion servant who falls ill. In Capernaum, a Roman garrison is located. One of its officers, a centurion of Gentile birth, who commands between 50 and 100 men, has a servant who is gravely ill, or is, as it says in the scriptures, grievously tormented, of what appears to be paralytic seizures. Belder Bussar McConkey writes, we may suppose that this military commander knew of the nobleman who also served Herod Antipas and whose son in Capernaum had been healed by Jesus' words spoken 20 miles away in Canaan. In any event, when Jesus was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him who said, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Wherefore, neither Neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man sent under authority, having under me soldiers. And I say unto one, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. The centurion's reasoning, profound in logic, perfect in showing forth faith, was to this effect. In other words, here is what the centurion is saying to the Savior. I, I don't feel worthy that you come into my house. I know you're the Son of God. And so back to Ellen McConkie's quote. In effect, here's what the centurion officer is saying. If I, a mere officer in the Roman army, must obey my superiors and also have power myself to sound others forth at my command, 
then surely as the Lord of all needs but speak, and his will shall be done. Do you see how much faith he has? If I have the power to command others just by my word, surely you being the Son of God, all you have to do is speak and my servant will be healed. Now that is faith. That is belief in Jesus Christ. Now remember, this is a Gentile centurion. This is not a member of the house of Israel. Continuing Brother McConkie, those who were with Jesus marveled at the message from the centurion. And Jesus said, I have not found so great a faith, no, not in Israel. This Gentile centurion Roman soldier had more faith than most of the house of Israel at the time. He knew this was the Son of God, and he had power in his words to command things. And he could command that his servant be healed. Back to Brother McConkie, such a teaching moment as this seldom arises, and of it the master teacher makes the most. Then quoting Matthew 11, Matthew 11 through 12, the Savior says, Many shall come from the east and west, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the wicked ones shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In just a moment, he who was not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, he who came to his kindred, that the word of truth might go first to the Jews and at a later date to the Gentiles, he who was the God of Israel. In just a moment, he was going to heal the servant of a Gentile whose faith exceeded the faith of the members of the chosen race. But before doing so, he chose to shake the theological foundations upon which Israel's preferential status rested, meaning, the Jews thought they had preferential treatment just because they were the chosen seed and they were the seed of Abraham. Our lineage demands that you prefer us over others. Oh, Christ is going to shoot all that down. Back to Elder McConkie. Many, not a few, Gentile hosts, members of the hated alien nations, many would find glory in heaven with the ancient patriarchs, while the literal seed, being the children of Satan, Jews who should have been the children of the kingdom, would be cast out. How little his Jewish hearers understood the meaning of that which Jehovah had of old time said to Abraham. Quoting now Abraham 2.10, As many as receive this gospel shall be called after thy name, and shall be accounted thy seed, and shall rise up and bless thee as their father. See, that's why Christ said many will come from the east and the west. Many will come from the Gentile nations that will believe even above the house of Israel. And so we see that even today. Matthew chapter 8, verses 24 through 27 is the miracle where Jesus calms the sea. I think there's some profound teachings in this little miracle. Well, little meaning short verses, not miracle in size. But in just a few verses, starting with verse 23, it says, And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. Verse 24, And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with waters, but he, meaning Christ, was asleep. Isn't that interesting? The ship is about ready to sink, or it appears that it is going to, because there's this great tempest and storm, yet Christ is asleep in the ship. Brothers and sisters, I submit to you that those who are enveloped in truth and know who they are and from whence they come as Christ did and who have the truth can sleep through storms. Notice he is not concerned. He is able to sleep through storms because of the knowledge of the truth that he has. 
the ability to be able to sleep through our storms will have a lot to do with our knowledge of Jesus Christ and of the truth and why sometimes these storms come. Christ has a clear conscience and so he's able to sleep through storms. Now verse 25, And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us. We perish. Really? Were they really going to perish? The Son of God, whose time has not yet come for the atonement, is sleeping in the boat. So what does that tell you about their lack of knowledge of him? They don't really understand who's in the boat with them, do they? Or they wouldn't have made that statement. Verse 26, And he saith unto them, why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? In other words, don't you understand who is in the boat with you? If you did, you would not have had fear. Or at least you would not have been fearful of the storm. They may have still have those fearful feelings. I mean, we all do. That's very natural. But you would have known that I am the Son of God and my time has not yet come. And so nothing is going to happen to you. So it's a, their lack of knowing Christ that causes there to have little faith. The more we come to know the Savior, the greater will be our capacity to exercise faith in him. So, brothers and sisters, that's why we study Scripture. That's why we seek the Spirit and to follow its promptings. Because then we come to know the Savior better. If they would have known who was in the boat with them, they wouldn't have worried. They would have had faith and said, we're fine. Everything's fine. Regardless of the outcome, we're fine. We're with the Son of God. That's why we need to come to know him. The more we come to know him, the more we will trust him, and the more we will put our faith in him. Then verse uh, 27, Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. He will do the same for us. He's not going to take every storm away but he will ride it with us in the ship. And if he's with us, then we can get through it. Or whatever the outcome, if he's with us, then it will be fine. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Anciently, a lot of the pagan religions believed, which these teachings would have rubbed off on the apostate Israel at this time. A lot of the pagan religions believed that the head god, the god that had the most power, is the one who could control the water. So that's why when he does control the water, walks on it, calms the seas, calms tempests, does those kinds of things, they are sorely amazed. It's because they've had some of these influence of these pagan religions and their teachings that the head god can control water. And so when Christ does, it does get their attention. Let's now turn to Mark chapter 4, verse 26 through 29. A short little parable that's only found in Mark, so that's why I decided to include it in here. And it's the parable of the growing seed. The parable of the growing seed that grows all by itself. In this parable, there are three symbols. First, the kingdom of God, which would be the church of Jesus Christ. Then there's a man, which is any legal administrator sent to preach the gospel. And then there is cast seed into the ground, which would be preaching the gospel, casting the seed. So let's take a look at those. This parable is addressed primarily to those called to preach the gospel message of salvation to the world. Their commission is to plant the seeds of the gospel message in the hearts of men and then leave the events in the hands of God just as a seed is planted in the earth and then is left up to God and the seed to grow. Conversion to Christ and his gospel cannot be forced upon anyone any more than a seed planted can be forced to grow. 
the harvest of converted souls is not brought about by the power of those who plant the seed. So as a missionary, as I go forth out and teach, I plant seeds, I, I sow the gospel, I, I share the word, but I can't force anybody to listen to it. The seed has to grow on its own. That the soil of the planted seed should be cultivated, water fertilized, and given every opportunity to grow. The ultimate sprouting and growth depends upon the power beyond that of the sower. Just as the earth brings forth of herself seeds grown by the power of God, so one is converted to Christ by the power of God and from the seed planted in the heart. I could not convert anyone on my mission or any of my kids. I can only plant the seeds of the gospel in their heart. And then by the power of God, through the Holy Ghost, can the seed begin to grow. If the person that's planted in decides to let it grow. That's what this parable is about. The power of God is what causes the seed to grow. If the one in whom it's planted will let that power come to him. Let's now go to Luke chapter 7, verses 11 17. We get the widow of Nain. The story of the widow of Nain, where she is carrying her dead son on a briar, and they're walking towards the cemetery to bury her son. And Christ now comes upon us. Picture that. You have a funeral procession, death, and then you have Christ who represents life, and death and life meet together. Can you picture that in this story? Death and life come together, and here's what happens. In almost all of the miracles Christ performs, the petitioner comes to Christ seeking the miracle, symbolic of our need to first come unto Christ as an act of faith. However, in this miracle of raising the widow's son from death, Jesus, out of compassion, seeks out the mother and performs the act without any instigation on her part. If you notice, this is one of the few in Scripture, one, there's only a few of them, where Christ, just out of compassion of heart, performs a miracle. Uh, every other time, the person comes up to him, the leper, the blind, the lame, the sick, the afflicted, they come to him and then petition him. And that shows their act of faith. That shows that they believe in him. And then he heals them. This is not that way. This is one of the few times this is done. Maybe this is teaching us that in the next life we will come to know that there were many times the Savior has acted in our behalf just out of sheer compassion because of our situation and has performed miracles that have enabled us to endure the sorrows of the world. I know I have felt that. I have felt many times the Savior has interceded in my behalf to help me with my struggles. It hasn't taken them away from me, but has helped me through them. It has given me the miracle of getting through my trials and sufferings. Ella Bruce R. McConkie writes the following, The living die and the dead live again because he wills it. There is no importuning of God, nor was there need for such. Jesus did it. Jehovah was there. His words were, I say unto thee, arise. He was claiming divinity, messiahship, eternal godhood. The proving of his claim, there was no blasphemy here, by raising the dead. So another reason he does it, one, out of compassion for the mother. Two, let me testify to you who I am. I am the God of the living, and only God can overcome death. And so he, de he claims his divine sonship by performing this miracle. Back to Elder McConkie. And is not this first known instance of calling mortals from death to life by Jesus, but a type and a shadow, a heaven-sent similitude of what this same Jesus shall do for all his people at an appointed time, 
Will he not say to all, Come forth from your graves, step out of your tombs, rise from your briars, live again, this time in glorious immortality, never to suffer the pangs of death again? And will he not then deliver the righteous into the arms of their mothers and fathers and loved ones? Yes, he will. In due time, he will give us the power and be able to say unto us, Rise from the graves. This miracle then being a similitude of that miracle that will come to all of us one day through the resurrection. Well, let's now go to this beautiful story in Luke chapter 7. Just a synopsis really quick. If you remember, Simon the Pharisee asked Christ to dine with him. Christ comes into his house, and while he's there, a woman comes and wets his feet with her tears and then dries them with the hairs of her head and then anoints his feet with oil. But before we turn to that, right before that happened, in Luke chapter 7, verses 19 through 23, we get John the Baptist is in prison. Okay, And he sends his disciples to the Messiah Christ and to ask them, Art thou the Christ? Now many have mistaken thinking that John wasn't quite sure. That's not what's happening in the story. Here's what's taking place. Many misinterpret these verses, thinking that John was not sure if Jesus was the Messiah. By sending his disciples to ask Jesus if he was one that should come, or look we for another. However, it was not John who was unsure, but some of the John's disciples. He needed to forsake the lesser light of John and to cleave unto the light of the world, even Jesus Christ. So he's sending them to Christ so that they would get a testimony of him. And ask, shall art thou the Christ? John already knows who he is. John has a testimony. We already know that. He's trying to get his disciples that are following him to turn now and follow the Messiah. Finding Jesus. Oh, now, now this is a, a quote from Brother McConkie in his book, The Mortal Messiah. He says, finding Jesus and the throngs who hear his words and who sick he heals, they identify themselves, saying, John the Baptist, or John Baptist has sent unto us, sent us unto thee, they say. Then comes the great question, the question upon which their salvation rests, the question that all investigators must ask for themselves. Art thou he of whom it is written in the prophets that he should come, or do we look for another? In other words, art thou the Son of God, who shall atone for the sins of the world, as promised by all the holy prophets since the world began, including John who sent us, or is our Messiah yet to come in another day to another people? We have heard John's witness. We know he said of you, he is God's own Son, the Beloved One, the very Lamb of God, who shall be sanctified, sacrificed for the sins of the world. But we would hear a witness from your lips, art thou? Thou the Deliverer, the Savior, the Redeemer, as John says you are. So that is what they're asking. Jesus answers by having John's disciples witness the fruits of his authority and messiahship. So, now quoting Luke 7, 21-22, In that same hour he, Christ, cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits, and unto many that were blind he gave sight. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way, tell John what things you have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf ear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached. You see how Christ answered them? He just doesn't come out and just answer simply, Yes, I am the Son of God. He shows them that he is the Son of God by performing merry miracles. By their fruits ye shall know them. That is what Christ is trying to teach them. Well, then after they turn and go and tell John the things that they have witnessed, and hopefully they came to a realization that this was the Messiah, we learn then in Luke 7, verses 24 through 28, that Christ then gives a great speech on there is no greater prophet than John. 
Then Jesus spake to the people once the disciples of John have departed. Jesus asked them what went they out to see when they went out to John in the wilderness of Judea. Three things he asked them. One, a reed shaken with the wind. Did you go out to see a person who was shaken to and fro and is not firm? No, that is not what you went out to see. John is not a reed shaken or bent, one who's not sure. He was sure of his witness of the Messiah and of the restored gospel. Did you go out to see a man clothed in soft remnant? Were you out to go see a wealthy man who has fine clothing and has all the things the world can offer? No, you didn't go out to see someone who just satisfied their lust of the flesh with things of the world. That was not John. And then three, but what went you out to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet. John, as a witness of his living Lord, was indeed a prophet. And in addition, he prepared the way before the very Lord so that the great prophetic ministry ever graced the earth would be manifest. He served as the Lord's messenger, carrying the message that the Lord himself the great Emmanuel, the God with us, of whom Isaiah spoke, was indeed with them. I think this little speech is interesting. What they went out to see and what they expected would determine what they saw. If you want to see all the flaws in your bishop, your state president, in your neighbor, in your spouse, then that's what you're going to see. But if you want to see a person who is flawed, but then who is trying and was making mistakes, but is repenting and is a son and daughter of God and is worthy of our respect, then that's what you'll see. We will see what we want to see, brothers and sisters. It will all depend upon our heart and the desires of our heart. Some went out and saw in John the Baptist a great prophet who was restoring the church back to an apostate Israel. Others went out to see him, and they wouldn't be baptized by him, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They thought he was a false prophet. But that didn't change the truth, did it? We will see what we want to see, and we will see what's within our heart. Luke chapter 7, verses 24 through 28, that there's no greater than John the prophet. Joseph Smith gave three reasons why John was considered one of the, if not the, greatest prophet. Here's what Joseph Smith said, why Christ said that. First, he was entrusted with a divine mission of preparing the way before the face of the Lord. Who ever had such a trust committed to him before or since? No man. Second, he was entrusted with the important mission, and it was required at his hands to baptize the Son of Man. Whoever had the honor of doing that, whoever had so great a privilege and glory, whoever led the Son of God into the waters of baptism and had the privilege of beholding the Holy Ghost, descending in the form of a dove, or rather in the sign of the dove, in witness of that administration. No one besides John has had that privilege. Thirdly, John at that time was the only legal administrator in the affairs of the kingdom there was then on the earth and holding the keys of power. The Jews had to obey his instructions or be damned by their own law. And Christ himself, himself fulfilled all righteousness in becoming obedient to the law which he had given to Moses on the mount and thereby magnified it and made it honorable instead of destroying it. The son of Zacharias wrested the keys, the kingdom, the power, the glory from the Jews by the holy anointing and decree of heaven, and these three reasons constituted him the greatest prophet born of women. It will be a privilege one day to meet John and to talk with him and to get his perspective. In Luke chapter 7, verses 31 through 35, the Lord now chastises the people, especially the leaders. And the Lord said, 
Whereunto then shall I liken the men of this generation? And what are they like? In essence, this is what the Savior said to them. This is from Miller Conkey's New Testament commentary. He says, What illustration can I choose to show how petty, peevish, and insincere you unbelieving Jews? You are like fickle children playing games. When you hold a mock wedding, your playmates refuse to dance. When you change the game to a funeral procession, your playmates refuse to mourn. In like manner, you are only playing at religion. As cross and capricious children, you reject John because he came with the strictness of the Nazarites. And ye reject me because I display the warm human demeanor that makes for pleasant social intercourse. That's in essence what he was saying in those verses when he compares them to children playing at games. And they were playing games instead of taking Christ seriously. Now let's go to this woman who anoints Christ's feet in the house of Simon, the Pharisee who hold a feast. Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. Elder Bruce R. McConkie writes the following concerning this story. And these I, I wanted to quote this because he just makes some excellent points here that I could not have written or said any better. And certainly I could not have done to the degree he does here. Is this woman coming to him and crying because she is a sinner? Or is she coming to him and doing this act of worship and reverence because she has repented and has been forgiven? And it's a show of gratitude. Which one is it? Let's see what Ellen McConkie says. Guests entering in Palestinian homes often remove their sandals, lest the pollutions of the street contaminate the mats and rugs on which family prayers were offered. At the dining table, they recline on couches with their feet toward outward from the table, and the dining hall was accessible to others than those bidden to partake of its appetite-satisfying bounties. All of this enabled a woman in the city, which was a sinner, carrying an alabaster box of ointment, to enter uninvited and to stand behind Jesus. According to the social customs of the day, she could even speak to the guest without being bidden to depart by the master of the house. This, however, she did not do. Rather, she stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with oil. All of the usual amenities of the day had been ignored by the day's hosts, as Jesus will soon remind him. But what the host should have done, however, Lee, reluctantly, the unbidden spectator, and she a woman, had now done with a full heart and in a spirit of penitence and thanksgiving. Why did she do it? What would impel a woman whose life had been stained with sin stained, perhaps drenched and buried in sin, for her past life could not have been other than one of gross immorality. What would impel such a person to come uninvited, face, face the sinless one, and as her tears bedewed his feet, wipe them with her tresses and seal the washing thus made with an anointing of costly ointment? She first washed the feet of Jesus with her tears, then anointed them with oil. Why? And was all this done by an evil sinner? No, not by any means. All this was the work and the worship of a devout and faithful woman who had been a sinner, but who was now cleansed, who was now free from the crushing burden of many offenses, who now walked in a newness of life because of him whose feet she now kissed and upon whom she now bestowed all the reverent and awe-inspired love that her whole soul had power to possess. This we must know if we are to envision what really transpired on this inspired occasion in the home of Simon the Pharisee. Here is a woman who once was a sinner, but now is clean. 
She is not going to give to forgive her sins. He has Jesus is not going to forgive her sins. He has already done so. It happened when she believed and was baptized in his name, and it happened when she repented with full purpose of heart and pledged her life and her every breath she thereafter drew to the cause of righteousness. We are dealing with a convert who has come to pour out in the spirit of thanksgiving and rejoicing the gratitude of her soul to him who was freed, freed her in times past from the chains of of bondage and hell. Simon is, in his present state, spiritually incapable of conceiving that a woman whose soul was once scarlet is now as white as snow. This is a story of a convert who is thankful and has such gratitude that she's overcome with tears, thanking the Savior for the opportunity to hear his gospel, to be baptized and enter his kingdom, and to be cleansed of her sins. This is a repentant woman coming to give thanks. And then it says in Luke seven thirty nine. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, that Simon, he spake within himself, saying, This man, do you catch that? That's what he calls Christ. This man. That shows you how little Simon knew who was in his home. He just considered him another man. No wonder Simon says and thinks the things he does and thinks this woman is just an evil, decrepit woman who is touching somebody and she should she be banished for her sins. This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman that is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. See, he can't see, he can't even recognize that this woman has been changed through the atonement that is to come of Jesus Christ because of her repentance. He still considers her a sinner. Now let's take a look and we'll read the verses themselves of Luke seven forty through 46. And Jesus answering said in him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he said, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed him five hundred pence, the other fifty. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he, Christ, said unto him, Simon, thou hast rightly judged. And you can just see the pride swelling in Simon's heart. Oh, I got that right. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. That is, that, that is just the what tradition and, um, what do you call it, manners, the manners of the time called for, that any guest he should have done that for. He didn't even do that for Christ, something that you would have done for anyone who entered into your house. But yet this woman comes and does it, washes his feet. Thou gavest me no kiss, meaning that you didn't greet me. But this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman who hath anointed my feet with hath anointed my feet with ointment. See, obviously this woman knows who it is that's in the house. Simon has no clue that this is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, who will be sacrificed for the sins of us all, and who will take upon him the consequences of all of our sins. She knows who it is. Therefore she responds accordingly. Simon has no clue it is, so he does nothing for him. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. 
and he saith unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. Now, to get the wording of this and to show that she is not being forgiven right then and there of her sins, that this has already taken place, and that she is coming because she has been forgiven and she's in gratitude, the great gospel scholar Alfred Edersheim said this, properly, properly rendered the two phrases, the first to Simon and the second to the woman should read. So this is the way they should read. This is how the Greek reads. Forgiven have been her sins, the many have been. And, he says to her, thy sins have been forgiven, the many. So Christ is just reconfirming what has already happened to her. And then Elder McConkie in his New Testament commentary writes, In effect, Jesus is saying, Her sins were many, but she believed in me has repented of her sins, was baptized by my disciples, and her sins were washed away in the waters of baptism. Now she has brought me out, now she has sought me out to exhibit the unbound gratitude of one who was filthy but is now clean. Her gratitude knows no bounds and her love is beyond measure, for she was forgiven of much. Had she been forgiven of but few sins, she would not have loved me so intensely. And so it is true. Why does Simon not love Christ? Because he doesn't think he has any sins. Therefore, he has no reason to have any love towards Christ and what he is going to do. Verse is because Simon thinks he is righteous. Brothers and sisters, there is no righteous person on this earth. The only totally complete righteous person was Jesus Christ. But the Pharisees thought they were. Hence their demise. Hence why he does not know who is sitting in his own house and why Simon does not love Christ. Brothers and sisters, our love of Christ will be in proportion to how much we know about Christ and how much we know of how much he did for us in forgiving us of our sins. The more I come to understand the atonement, and the great sacrifice he made, the more I will love Jesus Christ. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel.